Okay, so hopefully now you have some sense of the wounds you would like the Lord to help you heal. So we're going to begin with our first meditation. And we're going to begin and end each meditation in prayer. We're going to use the beautiful prayer called the Memorare to open up. This is a prayer for special protection to Christ through Mary for our lives. And we're going to conclude each meditation with the Anima Christi. This beautiful prayer that's traditionally said after receiving the Eucharist or when we cannot receive the Eucharist to spiritually unite ourselves to the Eucharist in Christ. Because we want to always be doing that, folks, with our redemptive suffering, which hopefully I'll explain in a minute. So we're going to begin in prayer. Okay, so let us begin with Memorari. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that any one who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy clemency, hear and answer me. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So this first talk is on life-giving suffering. This first talk of life-giving suffering is specifically on redemptive suffering. What should be our attitudes in the face of suffering? How should we respond? This one immediately is more about the vision, the attitudes, the thoughts that we should have in our souls during this time. And the next two talks will be more about the practical nuts and bolts of living it out. But it's very important that we understand suffering aright. Because in the modern world, we just try to get rid of it at all costs. But there's some suffering we cannot avoid. Of course, our own death. There's some inevitable suffering that will just be. But the beautiful thing is, our suffering doesn't have to remain just a wound. But we can respond in certain ways that brings goodness and light out of it. So what do we mean by redemptive suffering? Well, first of all, the church has always taught, in accordance with Christ and the scriptures, that God did not create evil and suffering. Evil and suffering was brought in the world as a consequence of his creatures' decisions and actions. In Genesis, right, it was the decision of Adam and Eve that brought evil into the world, not just between themselves. The first marital conflict and problem in their family came as a result of their sin, but also with the world, Right. Eve now has pain in childbirth, and Adam now has to toil with the land. So sin affects even creation, but again, from our own relation to creation. And we can see this very clearly with the coronavirus, right? Something with man's relation to nature was off in those wet markets in China that helped to bring about these viruses. Now, I might say, too, this could have happened anywhere. So we shouldn't just point the blame at China or whatever. No, this could have happened anywhere. Everywhere, man's relationship to nature is off. And through our sins, evil and suffering is introduced into the world. We see this again and again and again. Not just in nature, but also in the lives of our families, right? So much suffering comes from the sins that we do. And so the church teaches that God does not create sin and suffering in this world, but God allows it. He permits it for a greater good. Already in Genesis, the greater good is alluded to with the promise to Eve that her descendants would crush the head of the serpent, representing all evil in future generations. There's already, there's already this promise. So we have to be careful when we say, God allows or permits evil, that can make God sound pretty passive. But he's anything but. Already from the first moments, he promises to not just limit evil, but crush evil. He promises, in other words, to turn that evil into what we call as a greater good. Something greater. And that's, of course, most definitively love. We read very beautifully in scripture, this Bible verse, which is a promise 
that uh, God doesn't just simply remain passive. And it's from Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 to 5. It's very beautiful. I'll read it to you. Quote, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, wailing, or pain. For the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. God is active, responding to the suffering. He's not passive. He's not the absent father who just is in the back corner, not doing anything about this, okay? No, he's transforming it all to good. As St. Paul beautifully says, another beautiful verse, sort of summing up redemptive suffering, Romans 8, 28, we know that the Lord works all things to the good for those who love God. All things, including the suffering. Another Bible verse I love on redemptive suffering is 1 Peter 2, 24. By his wounds you have been healed. And this is referencing the promise in Isaiah. Again, by his wounds, you have been healed. Again, he's taking suffering, the wounds, bringing something good out of them, healing. By his wounds, you have healed. This is actually our motto on life-giving wounds. It comes from this Bible verse. This promise goes back to Isaiah. is also in, uh, fulfilled in Christ's uh, cross and resurrection. Notice here, suffering, the wounds can lead to something positive, healing. This turns on the head the secular wisdom that suffering is just pointless, meaningless. Now, don't get me wrong, folks. We should try to alleviate suffering as much as possible. But there's some suffering we just can't get rid of. We're finite. We're all going to die one day. But even in this suffering, this suffering that's inevitable, I can't get out of, like this quarantine we're in, we can turn that to the good. Christ is trying to do that right now in our lives. He's anything but passive. And with this Christian meaning of suffering in mind, John Paul II, in his beautiful letter on suffering called Salvici Dolores, which I really encourage you to read, he says, quote, Suffering is present in the world to unleash love in the human person. But this can only make sense in light of a Christian view of suffering, of redemptive suffering, which is utterly unique to Christianity. And it's, it's what John Paul II calls a boundary experience. A boundary experience is an experience between two realities. Suffering is this boundary experience. On one hand, a person who suffers experiences a trial, a pain, suffering, something that's not good. But on the other hand, John Paul II says, in that suffering can come what St. Paul would say, is a birth, a birth of power and weakness. A birth of power and weakness. That's when St. Paul writes, quote, I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. In other words, there's a power that's made perfect in weakness. And this power, St. John Paul II teaches, is love. That's why so many of the saints' greatest lessons in life, their most eloquent expressions of love and life, came when? At their death, their martyrdom. Or think about St. Maximilian Kolbe. What's the one thing you probably think of when you think of him? It was him offering up his life for the father of a family and giving his life for that. The most eloquent expression of love came in his death. That's because... When we unite our suffering, and this is the key, we have to unite our sufferings to the suffering of Christ. And when we do that, suffering can become a boundary experience. It doesn't have to just remain a wound, just a trial of pain. But there can be a birth of this beautiful power within weakness, this power of love. But we have to unite our sufferings to the Lord. This is key to redemptive suffering, it is not just accepting suffering, but turning it into an offering to God, because all suffering is a question to God, and only God's answer can answer that question of suffering. And God's ultimate answer to suffering, which by the way, when we say we unite our sufferings, we're specifically saying we're uniting our sufferings to Christ in the Eucharist. The Eucharist makes present for all time God's paschal mystery of the dying and the rising, the resurrection of Christ. <laughs> 
all time. He says, I suffer with you. Never for a moment will I leave you, but I will suffer with you. And so the Eucharist in Christ's life, made present for all time, now ushers in this new unheard of compassion. Compassion literally means calm with passion suffering. This new suffering with us. And when we unite our sufferings to Christ, specifically through the Eucharist, suffering becomes his. Now all of a sudden suffering is suffering with God and never alone. We are never alone. Ladies and gentlemen, even if we were to die in a hospital alone, we are never alone. Christ is there with us. And he can transform that suffering if we unite to him into redemption and love. By his wounds, you are healed. And then your wounds can also become healing. So yes, in suffering, there's this weakness. But if united to Christ, our suffering can become a power, a strength. John Paul II says, in particular, this type of suffering means to become particularly susceptible and open to workings of God in your life. He says boldly that it is suffering more than anything else, which clears the way for grace and transforms human souls. There it is. And Pope Francis teaches something very similar about redemptive suffering. He says very beautifully that our, wo our wounds are points of intimacy with Christ. Think that our wounds are points of intimacy with Christ. Our wounds are points of intimacy with Christ. Do you approach your wounds in this way? Do you give them to the Lord? Do you allow them to draw you closer to Him? Because redemptive suffering is turning the heartache of pain and to intimacy with the Lord, and then with others as well. And this is the big teaching and the beautiful teaching of the church through the ages, lived by the saints, lived by Christ, is that Christ didn't come to take away all suffering from this life, but he came to fill all suffering with his presence. Let me repeat that again. Christ didn't come to take away all suffering from this life, but to fill all suffering with his presence. So that yes, in the next life, there'll be more, no more tears and wailing and mourning. But the goal in this life is to fill our sufferings with his presence. How can we do that? My wife, Bethany, very beautifully said, to start to do this, it's like you're in a dark room. And you didn't know because your eyes are adjusting that Christ was there all along with you. But you didn't know. It's just this dark room of suffering, the fumbling around, whatever. And slowly you discover that there's this person in front of you. And your eyes adjust to the darkness and you see Christ. My wife so beautifully said that to begin to allow the presence of Christ in her suffering, we have to, what, accept the darkness so that our eyes could slowly adjust to see Christ's presence. So beautiful. It's always stuck with me. We've had a great number of sufferings in our life that we've had to deal with, more of which I'll share later. But first, we have to accept the darkness, the suffering, by praying and offering it to God, uniting our sufferings to God, and ask Him, Lord, help me to see your presence in this. Help me to adjust my eyes in this darkness to become more aware of you. Because you are here. Truly, you're here. So, it's true that some of our sufferings may never go away. That's why we say life-giving wounds. There's some wounds that may never go away. Uh, maybe some family of origin issue, maybe a disability, maybe a sickness, maybe a death. But a wound never just has to remain a wound. We can respond to it with greater faith, hope, love, joy. Knowing that Christ is with us and responding in ways that Christ wants us to respond. And if we do that, we can proclaim with the saints like St. Therese of Lisieux. I loved her line. Everything is grace. That's not just romanticism, folks, because she recognized that Christ could come down even in her darkest suffering of which she died. She died 
from tuberculosis, a lung disease. But the more she ailed, the closer she became to Christ and could say, everything is grace. Again, it was a repeating, a living out, really. St. Paul's words of Romans 8.28, we said earlier, we know that all works for the good, for those who love God. And the beautiful thing, too, is that God not only brings out good, but a greater good. We've always believed this. He brings out a greater good than the original suffering and evil that was inflicted to begin with. Why? Because when suffering is united to Christ and offered to others, there's always a surplus of love. Always. But we've got to unite our sufferings to Christ, in particular the Eucharist. So that's why, especially during this time, we have another suffering of not being present in the Eucharist. We unite our sufferings with the Christ uh, in the priest sacrifice. Because that priest never goes to the altar alone. He takes with us all of our needs. So we need to watch the daily masses. We need to make spiritual communions of uniting our suffering in particular with the Eucharist of Christ. So that we bring about this surplus of good. This greater good God wants to pull out of this mess. Now I want to conclude this series, this talk here with a real life example of what does redemptive suffering look like? I'll use examples from the saints throughout the series, but here I just want to talk about an ordinary person, and especially just to whet your appetite for tomorrow, we'll specifically talk about a saint who drew good out of quarantine. But right now, I want to conclude with a very ordinary man, but very much beloved by me. His name was James Cullen. He was my late grandfather. And um, he was a very close, dear friend of mine. He was a father figure of mine. And he loved his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. He was married to my, uh, my grandmother for over 64 years. A very faithful, holy marriage. Just a role model all along. Well, in 2010, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And the first thing he did when he was diagnosed and said he was only given a few months to live. He only had like four or five months to live. First thing he did was he thought of my grandmother and made sure everything was in order for her. So again, that idea of the turning his own suffering into love for her. He didn't first think about what do I want to do during this time to get, you know, cross off my bucket list. No, he thought of my, my grandmother. And then he reconciled with God. They went to Mass as much as they could. They said a daily rosary every day. My grandma was there with him. And uh, he went to confession, had anointing of the sick. He reconciled with God. Then he reconciled, of course, with his wife, although they had a great marriage. They still talked about the fights of the past, and they reconciled. And he reconciled with family members, some of which who had big wounds still and some anger towards him. He reconciled with him during this time. But throughout it all, he concretely united his suffering with the Lord. I saw this up close and personal because I was there with him the last few weeks of his sickness. And we prayed one day in front of the chapel, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. He struggled in pain to get to the Blessed Sacrament, to pray in front of it. He couldn't receive the Eucharist at this time, but just to pray in front of it. And I had to complete the Our Father, but he made sure to say, Thy will be done, nice and loudly. And I asked him, what are you offering this up for? And he said, the family, the family, the conversion of the family. Very concretely had a sense of uniting his suffering by God. But it didn't stop just right there. What was even more eloquent about it, and it stayed with me all these years, is the joy. He had a deep sense of joy throughout the whole process of dying. In particular, he was known for his humor, not just because he was Irish, but anybody in this situation would have had, uh, would have succumbed to this great fear of death. He did not have a fear of death, but he had humor. He would joke, for instance, just, I love this one joke of mine, or his, that he said, he said to me, this is just two weeks before he died. He said, Grandpa, what's going to be your sign uh, from heaven that I know you're listening to my prayers? He leaned over and he was like, victories. Notre Dame victories because we're really bad right now. <laughs> he was a good Notre Dame fan. So he was always joking like that. And he joked with my grandma too. 
um, with the gifts he got her and things like that. And this joking, this humor wasn't making light of the situation, but was a deep awareness that God was with him and so that he could still have joy. And he carried that humor to the day he died or a few days before he lost consciousness. But besides just the humor and the joy, the greatest thing is he allowed that suffering. He was already great at love, but he allowed that suffering to become even more an act of love. The most beautiful thing that my grandfather did was this. He really hoped and desired that he would die in his home with his family all surrounding him. He really wanted that to be his last wish and gift. Don't we all want that? We don't want to die alone, right? But he saw what a toll it was taking on my grandmother, who is also now deceased, taking care of him in the home. So he forewent his desire, his last desire, the desire to die in his home for the good of my grandmother and checked himself into a nursing home. Now, if there's anybody who deserves his last wish, it's a dying person but he did not think of himself in these moments. Rather, he did another act of self-sacrifice for the good of my grandmother. And he decided to go in the nursing home and die with one family member around. And eventually my grandma got to him before his hand, the warmth of his hand, passed away. But he gave up his dream of dying in the home with all the family around for the good of my grandmother. And all around him. He was self-sacrificing those last minutes for her. He turned his suffering into love for her. And that witness will forever stay with me of how I should approach even this current suffering. This is the surplus of love. This is the greater good that can come out of even the worst situations of death. And it can happen by very concrete Ordinary things like my grandfather's humor, like his prayer with his grandchildren, and like his sacrifice of choosing to check himself in a nursing home instead of dying at home, in his home, so it wouldn't be a burden to my grandmother. And he didn't hold that over. He kept that humor throughout in the nursing home. That's the greater good we're called to bring about in our families. All of us can do that. So the question, dear brothers and sisters, is knowing these truths about redemptive suffering, is how are we going to fill this suffering with Christ's presence in our life? How are we going to change and be different? What are we going to do today to live these truths of redemptive suffering for the world? That's the question I leave you with. God bless you. Let us now conclude with the Anima Christi, thinking of our wounds that we decided to put down on our lists and uniting them with, with the Lord, with Christ. Okay, so pray with me now, the Anima Christi. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from Christ's side, Wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come unto thee, that I may praise thee with thy saints and with thy angels forever and ever. Amen.